All right, so as one of the applications is this, and, and as we get go through the semester, I will try, and I might not have time to do it in class, but I might try to make a video of an example where relativity is important in, in our course. Okay, and you'll see many applications in magnetism. In fact, I won't be able to give you an example of relativity in this course until we talk about objects that are moving, charges that are moving. So when we get to relativity, whether you talk about the, you have two wires that carry current, there's a force between them. Really, in order for you to understand the force between them, you kind of need to know a little bit about relativity. Otherwise, if you think deeply about the force between two wires, you're going to look at, you're going to come up with some sort of logical inconsistencies in your analysis. Um, another application is GPS. You have to have, if you want your GPS to be accurate, you have to take into account not only special relativity, but general relativity. And you have to use general relativity because of the fact that the satellites are going around the Earth. That means you have an acceleration. And uh, general relativity takes that into account. Uh, anything involving nuclear power, nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, involves application of relativity. And those of you studying chemistry, for example, if you want to study the properties of heavy atoms like uh, gold, lead, um, mercury, some of their properties are as a result of the fact that uh, the electrons within, in, within deep and within the atom move relativistically. And those produce uh, interesting effects in terms of their properties. So these are some examples of the applications of relativity. And of course, if you do astronomy, if, if there's any of you folks who are interested in astronomy, uh, when, you kinda, when you do measurements in astronomy, especially with distance, distance stars, you do have to consider relativity, both general and special relativity. And we will not be doing general relativity in this course. Okay. So I just wanted to mention that. And then another thing I want to mention, and I'm taking time out of the lecture, is the lab worksheet because a couple of folks um, ask a question about the percent uncertainty. And they really, I really should have used the term, that's my mistake, I really should have used the term relative uncertainty. So let me, let me talk about the first problem on your uh, air propagation on the worksheet. And I'm doing the first problem because it's really easy. So the first problem you're told, you're given y equals b times x. What is delta y? Well, if you use air propagation, you'll get this. All right, that's very easy. But I'm also asking for the percent uncertainty, which is this. Okay, so for number one, and for all of them, you take delta y over y. Well, delta y is this. And y is b times x. The b, and I got to multiply by 100%. And so then this turns out to be delta x over x times 100%. That makes sense? Does that clarify things for some of you folks? Yes, no? I guess no answer makes, seems like everything's okay. And then for, I think, number two, you had z equals x to the y. I forget what it was. And then you got to calculate this. I shouldn't put the x there. So you want the expression that represents that. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. How much do you want us to simplify them? Um, as much as you can. I mean, let's, I, I know like the, the last one is not going to be a nice... Uh, it's not going to be a nice expression. That's okay. Just do what you can. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, the last one was really ugly. Okay. Um, but some of these other ones can be simplified. So yeah, go ahead and simplify them some. But yeah, not, not all of them can, not all of them will give you a nice expression at the end. Okay. And the next thing uh, I wanted to say uh, is, you know, I was talking about the appearance of objects in relativity. And, and us physicists have to be careful because we like to talk about, use the word appear. But in relativity, it's a tough thing because when you look at something in relativity, you're looking at something that's moving very fast. There's a certain period of time it takes for the light to go from the object to your eye which is the distance you are from the object divided by the speed of light. So when we talk about, let's say, a cube going by us at a very high speed, and we talk about its appearance, we have to be careful. Because in, in a lot of cases, what will happen is if you do a, a careful analysis, you'll see that the, uh, the appearance will be that the object rotated. Instead of really shortening one direction, it'll actually look rotated to you. So we've got to be careful what they say when we say it appears to you. You should really talk about what you measure instead of what you, what you see. Okay? And, then as, and, and for 50 years, after, for the first 50 years after the development of relativity, people really didn't talk, did not talk correctly about the use of this word. And then somebody wrote a paper on this topic saying, wait a minute, we got to be careful using what we, when we, the word appearance when we talk about relativity. Okay. So uh, I make a mistake. Everybody makes this mistake when we, when we say how the, uh, we talk about how the object appears. But we got to be very careful because really when an object like a cube goes by you at a very high speed, it, you'll see some rotate, the object will ro look rotated. A three, I mean, I'm talking about a, a three-dimensional object, okay? So, and I wasn't careful with that last time, so I apologize for that. Okay, so we've talked about simultaneity. We spent quite a bit of time on that topic. And so I want to do an example. Uh, talk, I want to talk about uh, clocks again. And it's really a simple example. It tells you a little bit about what we observe in relativity. So let's say I have, and this is the first example we did uh, last week. I have the rocket ship. And the person on the rocket ship shines a light upward and detects the reflected beam downward. Okay. Let's say that the rocket ship is moving horizontally. Let me know if the, the, this, this, this marker is fading, so let me know if you can't see it very well, okay? This thing is going at 0.80 C, four-fifths the speed of light. Okay, and so if you calculate gamma, it ends up being five-thirds. I'm not going to plug in the numbers. I think you can figure it out. Okay. Let's assume that, and I'm going to use weird units, okay, just because the speed of light is so big. I don't want to write out the speed of light. So let's assume that the distance d, I'm going to use weird units, is 15 light seconds. Which is the distance light travels in 15 seconds. So I'm going to write it like this. 15 times C seconds. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So the time it takes for the light wave, for the signal to go 
from the observer to the mirror and back, delta T prime is going to be twice the distance over C, which is going to be 2 times 15 C seconds divided by the speed of light. So 2 times 15 is 30, it is delta T prime, sorry. So it takes 30 seconds for, so this is a big rocket, okay, a really, really big rocket. Okay, so it takes that much time. I'm just using nominal numbers, otherwise have to, everything has to be in microseconds. Okay, so far? Now, we observe this happening. So in the picture that you see in the slide, we're the green person. We're stationary. We're also known as the lab observer. And we see this thing go by us. So the beam does this, and then does this. Okay? All right. What time do we measure? What is delta T? Well, delta T is gamma delta T prime. So it's going to be 5 thirds times 30 seconds which is 50 seconds. So this person measures the two events at the same place. So I really need to say that x initial prime equals x final prime. And I'll call it zero. And this person is actually measuring the proper time because that person on the rocket ship is measuring the two events at the same time. Event one, you send a light signal. Event two, is when you get it, when you receive it. We see the two events occur in 50 seconds. The time interval between two events is 50, 50 seconds. So, how far does the spaceship travel between those two events? Is it 50 seconds times the speed of light? Or however fast the spaceship is going, I mean? Yeah, so, so this distance then is going to be uh, the speed of the spacecraft. 0.8c times uh, 50, sorry. Oh. So it ends up being 40 times c Seconds. So that's the distance between the two events. And this goes back to your question, Michaela, right? This is, is, this is the same thing yeah. as what you asked before, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in so this sense... What would it be... Wait, wait, give me... If I put a mark here... And a mark here. Right, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was looking at the wrong equation. Yeah, it is okay. a change in time, not change in time. Okay. I mean, really, I mean, and, and maybe I didn't say what I said correctly, but I mean, really, if I put a ruler between those two points, it is a proper distance, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, but you're just measuring the velocity times on time. The, yeah, on the homework, it was awarded different. Okay. So that the distance between two flashes, according to uh, us, is is forty light seconds. So let's mark these. Let's we'll mark these two locations down. I'm going to put a clock here and a clock here in our frame. So let's say there's a clock there and a clock there. Okay. So for this person. T equals zero, send the light. T equals 30, 
signals received. For us, t equals zero, lights sent, t equals 50, the lights received. Okay so far? Yep, yeah. Okay, here we go. Now, according to the observer in the rocket ship, they're gonna say our clock runs slow. All right, because we see each other's clocks run slow. So the observer on the spaceship says, well, if I measure 30 seconds, you're going to measure a smaller time. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... Of course, that time is going to be decreased by a factor of gamma. So it's 30 over 5 thirds. And so this is going to be 18 seconds. Yeah. And so... What's that distance? What, what distance does that correspond to? Well, what's the distance between these two points? According to this person, what's the distance between these two points? Well, this person sees the distance between these two points contracted. So according to Rocket, The distance AB is 40 over gamma. So if you take 40 C seconds and divide by 5 thirds, you get 24 C seconds. So they, they, they're saying that, that we're going to observe the events through a distance of 24 C seconds, not 40. Okay? Because they're going to see this distance as being shorter. So just to be clear, uh, the proper length is going to be the one from the observer's perspective. Yeah, then, this is what we might, I mean. Yeah. And, yeah then I mean, the, and you're right, you can call it a proper distance. I mean... That, that's how the book calls it. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I would, I would also have to say, if I, I'd have to lay a, a ruler out and measure the distance of that ruler just to be careful. So let's say this clock and this clock are synchronized. And professor? Yeah. So... Um... How is that the proper length? Because when, when we see the rocket going, we are not seeing point B yet, right? We are at point A and then it travels to point B. So we actually did not see the point B at the same time as we saw the point A. You're How right about that. That's why I'm saying, suppose we mark point A and we mark point B, we take a ruler and then measure it. And in order for me to measure that distance, I have to measure the two endpoints at the same time, correct? Yeah. Okay, then, I, then, then in a sense I can call it the proper distance. That's, that's why I was saying, you know, I, I don't want to just say the, the change in these two coordinates is just the proper distance, but I want to say that if I take a ruler and measure the, you know, take a ruler and then 
actually make the measurement at the same time, then I can call it the proper distance. I'm just being, I mean, it might sound like semantics, but I'm just being careful. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's say there's a clock here and a clock here. And there, and in our reference frame, we synchronize them. Okay, so that means that at t equals zero, what does this read for us? Well, it reads zero. And then at this point, when this, this reads 50 seconds. Correct? Mm -hmm. But this person says, this person says, um, the event happened in 18 seconds. This person is saying our clocks aren't synchronized. Right. If, if, we're, if we synchronize the clocks, the person in the rocket says, no, your clocks are not synchronized because the event takes place, you observe the two events as taking place in 18 seconds. So the question is, when event A occurs, and the rocket is at this location, what does this clock read? What does this clock read when the light is sent upward? That's the question we need to answer. Because it's, this person is gonna say it's not zero. Well, in fact, we know that if two clocks are synchronized in this reference frame, this person can say our clocks are not synchronized. And we calculate an equation which will tell us how much these clocks are not going to be synchronized according to this person. And the equation that we derived last time was this. So if we take 40, times the velocity over c squared, we get 32 seconds. So what this person is saying is that these two clocks are out of sync by 32 seconds. Now if you think about it, what's the difference between this and that? What's 50 minus 18? 32. 32. So they match. Okay. What does this mean? So I, I drew some pictures in your notes, and I think what I'm going to do is kind of share the screen. Let me, let me magnify. Let me make this bigger. So... L naught is the distance between A and B as measured by uh, Chase. Uh, L naught is the distance between A and B as measured by uh, us. And yeah, we can call it a proper distance. Okay, so I drew a picture. This is what is observed according to us. Rocket sends, uh, rocket sends light signal to, towards the mirror at t equals zero. So at t equals zero, the clock that I had at point A and the clock that I had at point B both read zero because we synchronized them. When the light signal is received, when the rocket, in, in other words, when the rocket is at point B, 
Both clocks at A and B read 50 seconds. Does that make sense? So I'm looking at what both clocks read. One at A and one at B. Now let's do this from the rocket's perspective. Okay, so I drew this from the rocket's perspective. When the rocket sends the signal upward, the clock at A equals zero, but the clock at B does not. The clock at B reads 32 seconds. In fact, the clock at, according to the rocket, the clock at B is a trailing clock. And some of you folks had the question the other day about which one's a trailing clock. This, I think this picture kind of shows it to you. So, uh, at T, when T sub A equals zero, T sub B equals 32 seconds, according to the person on the rocket. And then when uh, the rocket passes point B, 18 seconds have elapsed. So the clock at A reads 18 seconds, and the clock at B has also ticked off 18 seconds. It reads 50. So that, kind of, that example kind of shows you how the lack of uh, synchronicity between the two clocks works. Any questions? Um, so, like, the time intervals measured, they are different, but the clock reads the same for both. At the end, right? Yes. Okay. Wait, so the clock, the clock is on the rocket, or it's... Um... The clock is on the ground. These are the clocks on the ground. I mean, these are our clocks. Right. And if the rock what the rocket is saying that when uh, T equal when when at T equals zero, T sub A equals zero, or T T initial prime equals zero, the clock at A reads zero, but the clock at B reads the clock at B reads thirty two seconds. So the can you repeat again which one's the graph? at the top and the bottom. The, the graph at the top is from like the person no, the person inside the rocket? Yeah, this is this viewed from the person inside the rocket. Okay, okay. Oh, I thought you said the opposite and I was super yeah. confused. So I was I, like, I, does it make sense? <laughs> yeah, I just, I just noticed a, a little mistake in the picture. The reflected wave shouldn't be in the top one. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom one should just have the reflected signal. So I, I, that, that's a mistake in my picture. So, so uh, Vincent, what's your question? I don't, I don't know. I'm just really like, I'm just really struggling with this. I don't know what it is. Also, what, what are we trying to answer with this? I'm trying to show you that even though the clocks are not synchronized, the time intervals are okay. I mean, the person on the ground, us, reads a 50-second time interval. The person in a rocket reads a 30-second time interval. But the reason why, uh, you know, the events are, you know, simul you know, you don't see the clocks being synchronized. Well, you, you see a 32-second 30, difference between A and B according to the rocket. The 32 seconds that the rocket observes plus the 18 seconds they think the two events take place that we're going to measure add up to 50. 32 plus 18 is 50, and we measure 50. The reason why they, they, they say we, we see 18 because there's, the clocks are not synchronized. They say our clocks are not synchronized. So they have their own clock on the rocket, and they're looking at that? Yeah, they're looking at, at their clock, and then basing, using relativity, I don't want to say they're looking directly at our clock, but
but um, I got to be careful with that. But if they had something that electronically sent them the signal as to what the clocks read at the two at A and B, they would get a signal such that at T sub A equals zero and T sub B equals 32 when he sends the light signal. When he receives the, right, the, the light signal, the clock at A is 18 seconds and the clock at B is 50 seconds, according to the rocket. So to the person on the rocket, 18 seconds, they say to us, this took 18 seconds. And to us, we say it, it took 50 seconds. And everything's consistent. And the reason why is because the clocks are not synchronized, according to the person on the rocket. Wait, where did we get 18 again? Well, let me go uh, to the board here. Oops. So, remember that the event takes 30 seconds in the rocket. Okay, and this is the proper time. So someone on the rocket says, this person says, the two events take 30 seconds. We're all in agreement with that, right? Yes. Okay, but if you're on the rocket and you see somebody go by you at this speed, you're going to say that person's clocks are slower. Remember that we both see each other's clocks as running slow. Right. Okay. So by a factor of gamma, so you take 30 over gamma, 30 over 5 thirds, or 30 times 3 fifths, you get 18. Okay. Thank you. That's where the 18, so they think we observe the two events in 18 seconds. We observe the two events in 50 seconds. And the, the difference is due to the fact that the clocks are not synchronized. The clocks are off. The clock here and the clock here are off by 32 seconds, according to this person. It takes a while for this to sink in. Other questions? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So you said from the rocket observer viewpoint, why would B be considered the trailing clock whenever it is ahead of clock A by 32 seconds? Okay, so let's look at this picture. So um, when you look at this picture, doesn't the rocket pass clock A first and then clock B second? Yeah. So that means B is trailing, right? So it's not trailing in terms of time, like it's not behind. It's just trailing the idea physically. that it hadn't passed it. Yeah, it's, it's physically trailing it. Okay. It's the one that's behind. I was behind. thinking trailing like behind. Yeah. Yeah, and, and when I read books, some, some people say the rear clock or some people say the chasing clock. The chasing clock is kind of, a wor kind of worse to me. I don't know. Other questions? So Chase, which observer are you talking about? So you're talking about us, right? Okay. We will see, so we will see the rocket being contracted, but I never mentioned anything about the length of the rocket. This distance is the distance between when we observe the light signal being emitted and the light signal being received. This is the distance we measure in our frame. We can't say anything about length contraction in the rocket's frame because both events occur at the same time. I'm sorry, at the same place, sorry. I'm 
I'm just trying to alleviate some of the confusion. So go ahead and ask me questions. Because if not, I will move on. And if you want to bring up questions on Thursday, please go ahead and do so. So, okay, I'm going to go on then. Another, um, um, one of the, I guess, they're called paradoxes. There's a lot of paradoxes that occur in, in, uh, in this field that are very, that are confusing. This is one, it's called a twin paradox. And one can spend two lectures going over the different ways to resolve this paradox. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go through this quickly. Suppose you have two 20-year-old twins, Speedo and Goslaw. And you, you know those names from the homework. Let's say Speedo goes to a star 30 light years away. Okay. Um, when Speedo comes back, he is 41 years old and Goslo is 84 years old. Since moving frames see clocks in each other's frame to be moving slow, who is actually the one that's moving? Uh, who's the, I guess, who's really the slower one? The, uh, the older one. Because each person says, that the other person's uh, younger because the clocks are slow. How do we resolve this? So a person travels from A to B and comes back. And since the two move relative to each other, each person is going to say the other one's uh, age less. Who's the correct person? I think it's, isn't it Goslo here? Yeah, Goslo is the older one, right? Yeah. Goslo is the older one. Yeah. Is, isn't he correct? Yeah, why do you say that? Um, because, like, till this point, we have said that the, the person is moving at constant velocity. And here... If we see the speedo goes and comes back, that means at some point his speed was zero and then it accelerated. So it was not the true um, observation by speedo? Correct. I mean, we can't use Goslow's reference frame to make the observations because Goslow's not always is not an inertial not right. always an speed inertial is, frame speed is going to be the proper like speedo's reference is going to be the proper time right well let's just say speedo's is the is the inertial frame yeah right because speed is always going at a constant speed goslo is accelerating at, at various points so you cannot make the observation, Gosla cannot make any, any claims because they're changing, they're changing speed because everything we've been talking about assumes that the speed's constant. And one can do an analysis, a detailed analysis, and, and I can't do that here, um, in many different ways to show that this is correct without invoking, um, you know, the what happens when you accelerate? You know, what happens to the, what are the acceleration values? Without having to do that, we can, we can actually show that uh, one person is truly old, older than the other one. Unfortunately, I don't have time to do that. Mm, professor? Yeah. So are you saying that here Goslo is incorrect? I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I said it wrong. Speedo is incorrect. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to be like, what? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, Gos Goslow is the older person. Points, right? Yeah, Goslow is the older person. Goslow is correct. Goslow is the person who never um, changes speed. Sorry about that. Sometimes I get tongue-tied. I'm going to briefly say something about, this is one of your homework problems.
I think it's number three. Yeah, it's three. So um, when you do this particular problem, and again, it's an idealized problem because we're taking the, the accelerations are instantaneous, okay, which is ob obviously non-physical. Okay. So um, to do the problem, you have to calculate how long it takes for person A to reach the planet. And then you have to use time dilation to really see how, uh, how much that person has aged because in their reference frame, they've aged less, right? So the 10 light years are like, the distance is according to us, right? Yes. Yeah, that distance is according to us. So, gonna, so you want to calculate T sub A. But then you also want to calculate T sub A over gamma. Because that's what A is going to say. That's how long he or she has aged. Okay. And then you got to do the same thing for B. You got to calculate T sub B and T sub B over gamma. When A reaches so when A reaches the, uh, the planet, so when A reaches the planet, A is in the Earth's frame. And again, we're assuming instantaneous accelerations, which is not real, right? But let's not worry about that. So the question is, how long must A wait for B? Well, in the Earth frame, in the Earth's frame, it takes T sub A, T, T sub A takes this amount of time to get there. T sub B takes this amount of time to get there. Of course, T sub B is bigger than T sub A in this problem. So you take D sub B minus T sub A is the wait time. Now what? What do you do next? Do you calculate how many years passed for a uh, student A and then add that wait time to it to get their age? Yeah, T sub A gets there, get it real fast, right? T sub B takes. Yeah, so you calculate how much do they age, right? For each of them. Yeah, I, I can do this. this. I can take T sub B over gamma. We know how much T sub B will age. And then I subtract from it Right? I mean, that's one way to think about it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So without me going through the whole problem, I'll let you guys go through the problem in the homework. Okay, some of you folks probably have already done it. But it's kind of good to go through it. And the reason why I go through it is because it's kind of weird because... There are accelerations in this problem, and we're kind of ignoring them. Okay. Um, so,
So now I want to introduce to you the Lorentz transformation. Now we've talked a little bit about, and it's taken a couple of lectures, talk about uh, what Einstein's did and the implications of what Einstein did. Um, these resulted in developing a new transformation between different coordinate systems. So if you remember, the Galilean transformation uh, looked like this. Okay, and t equals, this is the Galilean transformation. But because of relativity, this is going to change. I'm not going to go through and derive it, but I do want to say a few things about the Galilean, I mean, the Lorentz transformation, what properties it must have. Okay, so in order to derive this, it must have certain properties. And the properties I list... In fact, let me make this screen larger. The properties that I list there are not properties you can prove. I mean, these are properties based on experience. Okay, these are properties based on our experiences in, in our lives. So, first of all, the Lorentz transformation has to be dependent linearly on time. Okay, it can't be, it cannot depend quadratically on time. In other words, let me, let me write something down. I'll make something up. Let's pretend, so let's pretend I had something like this. Uh, I'm going to make I'm putting a constant here to make the dimensions make sense. Let's say it looked like that. What would be bad about it? Or maybe this will make it more obvious. What would be bad about that? Well, if I solve this for t squared, how many answers do I get? If I invert this equation and solve for t squared, how many, how many answers do I get? <coughs> two. So, so that means that an event at a location and place can happen twi at two different times. The same event. or the, It wouldn't make sense. You can't have something happen twice. Or you can have something happen before the cause. Or you can have uh, an event that's going at a, at a constant velocity in one frame, but accelerating in another frame. You'll have non-physical bizarre things happening. And so we expect the transformation to be linear. We also expect to obey causality, which means cause produces an effect. Okay. In other words, if I push an object, if I push an object, I should, ex I should expect it to see it accelerate. You don't see the, the opposite happen where it's accelerating before the force is applied. Okay. So we also have to assume space and time are homogeneous. The results of an experiment don't depend on where and when it's carried out. And there's also no preferred direction to carry out an experiment. Okay. Because none of these can be really be proved they're just based on experience. I'll change the marker. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to write so I'm writing down the Lorentz transformations. There they are. I'm not deriving them. So let me say what they are, what they mean, etc.
And we're going to make life easy for ourselves. We're going to assume the reference frame is only moving in the x direction, okay? Let's not do a more complicated version. This is the Lorentz transformation for the x coordinates. And then there's one for the y coordinate. Well, that's easy because if you're moving in the x direction, the y coordinates don't change. Thank goodness. Okay. And then the time one. And remember gamma, you know, remember gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And you guys see that one, this marker, okay? Yes, thanks. So I'm, I'm, I'm not deriving this for you. This probably didn't show up very well. I guess this one's done too. Um, what happens when v is very small? What's this equal to when v is very small? One. One. This is one. And so what do we end up getting when v is small? The Galilean. The Galilean. Yeah, you get the Galilean transformation. And when v is small here, this term is zero, that term is one, you get t equals t prime. So really, Einstein had great insights say, saying, yeah, maybe the Galilean transformation is approximately correct. And th these, are, these are correct. These are actually not super, super hard to derive. They're just a lot of algebra, which I don't want to get into. Okay. So what does this represent? If you have a clock, if you have clocks, let's say at, uh, let's say at x sub 1, This will tell you what the moving frame will see, or I'm sorry, this will tell you what the moving frame will measure when the clock at x1 equals t1. Okay, I'll say that again. This equation, if, if, you're, in the, if you're moving, will tell you what the time is at x1, when the clock at x1 reads t1. And then this one, if I do this, then x1 prime is really the location in this, in the moving frame, when x1, at location x1 and t1. And then for, if you want to go between, from the prime frame to the unprime frame, and all you got to do is change this plus, this minus to a plus. And I'll just do the bottom one, because these don't change. What about velocity? Well, to, to, to actually, you can actually derive the velocity transformation because uh, u prime of x is going to be dx prime over dt prime. And so you can take this expression, you can take, you can take differentials all the way through. And you can simplify it. 
And if you actually go through the algebra, you get these as the velocity transformations. So I guess I should write, I'm going to write some of these down. Because we're going to do an example before we leave. Let me check the time real quick. Okay. So, let me write these down. Wait, so it's stationary looking at a moving thing and then yeah, moving the, looking at the a prime, stationary? The prime is stationary, the prime is moving, sorry. Did I, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Um, yeah, so the, the ones on the right on the slide are if you're moving along with the object that's moving. No, this is, so let's say, let's say I have a rocket moving with speed V. And I throw something in the rocket that way. U prime x. U prime x is the velocity of the object relative to the rocket. V is the velocity of the rocket or the velocity of the reference frame. And this is us. So this is the first equation that you see on the, uh, well, the first equation you see on the, on the left is to, express what this guy would measure in terms of us. And then the second one is to express what we would measure in terms of what's measured in the rocket. Is that okay? Wait, so the, the one on the left is the guy in the rocket measuring the ball or measuring us? Yeah, u sub x prime is this value written in terms of what we measure. Remember, this is our frame, this is the lab frame. The prime frame is the rocket frame. Okay, just think of the prime frame as the rocket frame. So the one on the left, you're going, you're transferring from stationary to moving, meaning that you're trying to figure out, this person's trying to figure out what the speed is of the object in terms of what I measured. The ones on the right represent what I'm going to, I'm going to calculate the speed of the object in terms of what someone on the rocket measures. Is that okay? Uh, I think so. Just remember the prime frame is the rocket frame, the, the, the frame that's moving. So the prime equations are just telling what the velocity's value would be in that frame. I'm sorry, say that again? So it's like the equations where we have like prime equals the equation, there we are just finding what the value for the velocity would be in that prime frame. Correct. Okay. It's going to tell you what the velocity is going to be in this frame in terms of the unprime frame. Mm -hmm. But in like, actually we can consider either one of the frames to be moving, right? Just the direction would change. Th that's right. That's why one's plus and the other one's minus. Okay. Right. That's why you see the, 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 the difference in the signs. Mm hmm Right. Okay. So let me write down the other ones here. I'm really going to be concerned with this one. I don't, I'm not going to... We don't do it too many problems with why... And I know there's a... There's a quick quiz one where you have to look at the one in the y direction in the book. 
Okay. Okay, I'm just writing them down. Okay, so like problem number four in the homework, if I remember correctly, you, you, can, you can just solve with the Lorentz transformation. You're going to have to use two of them. If you, and you, that's one way to solve them. So what, what does all this all mean? Why do, what do these transformation mean? What do they imply? And I'm just stating your results. I'm not going to prove things here. So the transformations, they imply that two inertial frames will disagree about the distance between two points. They will disagree about the time interval between two events. They will disagree about the acceleration of an object. They will disagree about the acceleration of an object. Okay. But they will agree about all the laws of physics. They will agree that a free body moves with constant velocity. And if there's a force acting on an object, then all, of, all frames will say that that force is going, to call a, an, is going to cause an acceleration. They won't say that the accelerations are going to be the same, but a force causes an acceleration. Okay. And the velocity of light in, this, in a vacuum is the same in any reference frame. And that quantity that you see there, x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c delta t squared is the same in all reference frames. And in fact, we can't think three dimension anymore. Space and time are, are, are linked. And so the distance between the two points, x squared, you know, the x squared plus y squared plus z squared is not invariant anymore. It's that quantity that's invariant, that quantity that you see there. As a result, and I'm, I'm just going to say this, and don't worry about it. Um, we don't use vectors with three coordinates in relativity. We use vectors with four coordinates in relativity because vectors with four coordinates in relativity can be written in such a way that they are invariant. They, they have the same, they look, to, they have the same uh, value in all different, all different, uh, Lorentz frames. Okay. So if you do a Lorentz transformation on these vectors that have four components, they're going to have the properties that are going to be invariant in all reference frame. So distance in, in, in relativity actually has a time component to it. Okay. So that's some of the consequences of this. So I want to do, I want to do the light clock example. So before I, I, I go on, um, I have, let me show you these examples. This example, this example, these two examples, and this one. So I, I still got to make a video for this. But I've created a bunch of videos because I know time, I'm not gonna have time to do them in class. So I have like four of these examples. Like the, the, the examples after this one, I have videos for all of them. And so I would like for you to watch them. Okay, so if you want, if you want examples, look at them. And on Thursday, please ask me questions about the videos. 
They're not very long. They're between five and eight minutes each. Okay? And if you go on the modules, there's a, there's a link to a page with, with all the videos for this. So I need you to watch the videos. You might, maybe you might see a problem similar to that on the exam. So watch the videos, okay? So it's uh, the ones following the slide. So I want to go back to the light clock examples and apply the Lorentz transformations. Is, not, is one of them not working, Jacob? Okay, I'll double check. So this one was not available. Okay, I'll, I'll double check because I thought I made them. I'll, I'll make sure that they're okay. Okay, I'll fix that. Thank you. That, my, that probably was my fault when I uploaded it. Okay. I'll, I'll fix that uh, right after. I want to do the light clock example. I think that's probably going to be the last thing I do. That will be the last thing I do today. Okay. So let me use, I'll use this marker. Okay, so here's the mirror. And the light is sent this way. This is point A. This is point B. I'll call this X initial. I will call this X final. And again, if you remember, T was equal to 2 times 15 C seconds over C, or delta T prime, sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let X initial prime equals X final prime because the two events are going to happen at the same place. We were given the gamma was five thirds, in other words, V was 0 0.8 C. And B is the location of the second clock. This is where the light returns to the observer. So this is, so there's a clock here, and there's a clock here, And this is where the clock over here is basically when the light returns back to the, the observer on the spaceship. Okay. So I want to calculate, I want to use the Lorentz transformation. I want, to, I want the location of ship Location of ship um, according to X when T prime equals 30 seconds. So I want to use this equation. I want to know how far you are away from point A when the light signal goes back to the observer on the spaceship. So I'm going to use this equation. I'm sorry, this equation. X um, equals, X of B equals gamma times X prime final plus V 
t prime. And of course, x prime final and x prime initial are the same, so this is zero. Gamma is five thirds. Point eight times thirty is twenty four. Twenty four times five thirds is forty. So if this is x equals 0, this is, or x of b or x final, is going to be 40 c seconds. So I'll call this x final or x of b, no, no prime. So I use the Lorentz transformation to just show you how that works. Um, what is the clock reading at B okay what is the clock reading at B when the spaceship reaches this location. So I want to use this equation. I want to know what this reads when the spaceship reaches this point. So, what's t prime final? Well, if, if you shine the light here at t initial prime equals zero, and delta t is 30 seconds, then t final prime has to be 30 seconds. Because 30 minus zero is 30. Gamma is 5 thirds. T sub final is 30 seconds. What's x prime final? Well, the two events occur at the same place, so it's zero. Thirty times five thirds is fifty seconds. So far, so good. They, you know, what we these agree with what we've had before. Okay, so here's, here's a good one. This is where uh, these equations work, help you a lot. What does the ship say about the clock at B when the signal's sent? What is T sub B? when signal is sent. The signal is sent at t initially equals zero. The location is at 40 c seconds. So I need, to, I need an equation that has this in it and this in it. Right? I need an equation that has this in it and this in it. I'm actually going to use that one. When t initial prime equals zero, We want to know what the clock at B reads when t initial prime is zero. We want to know what the clock at B reads. 
So V is located at 40, 40 light seconds. Okay, so this whole thing is zero. I want to solve for T sub B. The gamma cancels, and so I get T sub B equals X sub B V. Hopefully you can see that. If not, I'll, I'll fix the camera. X sub B is 40. And we get 32 seconds. Can you guys see that okay? Is it, bl it looks blurry on my camera. Does it look okay? It looks a little blurry, but I, it, it's readable. Okay. Sorry about that. It's just hard to get that big a feel of you. I'm trying not to erase those equations and I'm not trying to erase this stuff. Hey, Professor. Yeah. Is uh, the T initial prime equal to zero just because according to the person on the ship, the clock reads zero when he starts his movement? Yeah, we're, we're saying that when the light signal is sent, this reads zero and this reads zero. Let's just say both read zero when the signal is sent. I, I, I need, otherwise I, I, I can't solve the problem. I need that information. Okay, so let's say both of them see, at least at this point, the light being sent. Okay. But when that happens, this clock already reads 32 seconds. According to the person on the rocket. Right? According to the person on the rocket, not this person. Okay. So one last thing I want to, I want to ask. What does... The rocket observers say about the clock at A when T prime equals 30 seconds. And I'm going to have to erase things because I don't want to, I'm running out of space. What does rockets say? about the clock at A uh, when T prime equals 30 seconds. And again, I'm going to use this equation, T final prime is equal to gamma T sub A. And this is T sub A final. Um, we have a little, oh, okay. Plus V X final prime over C squared. What's this? What's this value? What's x final? What's x final prime? Zero. Zero. So t final prime equals gamma t sub a. This is thirty seconds. So T sub A, I'm running out of space, which is 18 seconds. We get all the results from, uh, we, we get all the results that we had in the previous example. Okay. So the observer on the rocket says the observer on the ground measures a time of 18 seconds between two events, while the ground observer says that the two events took place in a time of 50 seconds. 
The difference is due to the fact that the person on the rocket says that the clocks at A and B are off by 32 seconds. So I've done the same example several times. Okay. All right. So I will look into the issue with one of the videos. I actually, I, I do have to add one more video. I'll show you which one. And part of it is because I have something, to, some, several things to say about it. So I, um, I have several things to say about this, this example. So I'm going to go through it. And then on, in the lab on Thursday, I want to do one more example. And I'll be done with kinematics finally. And then the rest of Thursday, what I'll be doing is doing energy and momentum. And I do have a lot of derivations on energy and momentum. I don't have to do them, so it'll really shorten my lecture on, on Thursday. So uh, we have enough time to cover all the material. Okay, so uh, I, that I wouldn't worry about. So I have one more kinematics transformation equation example, and then I'm just going to do energy and momentum. But the energy and momentum, I'm not going to derive the equations. Generally, they're not derived in an introductory physics class. I, I, I do have a lot of stuff in the notes that can easily be skipped. So we, we have time. Okay? Um, Questions? Oh, professor? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the calendar that we have, it says that we're supposed to read some from like chapter 23, I think, on before Thursday. Is that accurate? Or are yeah, we we're only bit... focusing? I would do it at, uh, after the exam. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Because, um, and with chapter 23, I can, I can catch up fairly easily. Um, so okay. we should be okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I have one relating to like the equations that were on the small whiteboard. Okay. Um, Ones that you erased with like the u sub x, what was the u supposed to like represent? The u is the velocity of the object uh, relative to the reference frame you're in. Okay. So for example, you know, I'll, I'll uh, let me go back to the equations. So. I'll draw the, uh, the rocket example, etc. And I'm going to erase this, sorry. And in fact, I'll do, a, I'll, 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 I'll do something maybe a little bit more tangible. Suppose you're in a car or you're in a bus and you're in a super fast bus, okay? So here's the big, it's a big bus. And you're standing in the bus. And you throw a ball horizontally. I'm going to call that velocity u sub x prime. Okay? The velocity of the bus, I'll write as V, and I'm going to call this the prime frame. So this represents the speed of the object relative to you on the bus. I'm watching the bus going to the right. I'm just sitting there. And I measure, if I, if I want to measure the velocity of the ball, I get a value, u sub x, you get u sub x prime. This is the velocity relative to my frame. This is the velocity of the ball relative to my frame. I can express the velocity I measure in terms of your velocities this way.
Does that make, is that okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, let's make, I mean, if, if, if uh, this denominator here is really small, if, I threw, if you threw the ball at 30 miles per hour to the right, and the bus, so U prime is 30 miles per hour, and the bus is going at 40 miles per hour, then what I would measure is 40 plus 30 is 70. Right? And let's assume this thing is too small, we, we can ignore it. Right? It, when, when, when V is small, this approaches the Galilean transformation. This will approach the Galilean transformation when, 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 the, when the bus is not moving very fast. So if the bus is going at 40 miles per hour and you throw the ball at 30 miles per hour relative to the bus, then I'm going to measure 70. Okay, so, so I missed some of the, the chat. Chase, can you? I'm trying to see what you were saying. So, um, which equation, Chase, which one are you asking about? Are you asking about this one? Okay. So I'm asking, what does the rocket say? I spelled about wrong. About this clock, I erased the picture. But what, is the, the, what does the rocket say about the clock at A? when t prime is 30. t prime is the final time in the movie in the rocket frame, right? In other words, when the rocket is here, what, is, what does this clock read? So I need to know t final prime I need to know T final prime. Yeah, I think I, ma I made a mistake with my notation, sorry. Professor? Yeah. Um, in this equation, shouldn't like in place of x sub f prime, sh shouldn't it be x initial? Yeah, you're because right. Because if we look at the original equation, yeah, you're right. In the original equation, yeah, I messed up. I copied it wrong. Sorry. You're right. It's x initial, which is zero anyway, right? Yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question, Chase? Okay. Sorry about that. That's my bad. Okay. I was just trying to rush, I guess. So, yeah, you're right. It should be X initial. Damien, you had, you had the same question? I was just trying to talk about it, but it, okay. why are we talking about the uh, position at the initial point if we're talking about the final time? Well, because I'm, well, what I'm asking for is, what does the clock read here? What does the clock read at this location when this reads 30 seconds? When this clock reads 30 so seconds. So the X to I is referring to the position of the clock, not the position of the rocket ship? Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, the X represents the position of the clock. That's, 
That's why it's, it's very careful. You have to be very careful what quantities you're using there. Um, and and Rav Tesh pointed that out. This, this has to represent the position of the clock because they're trying to find what the position, what the clock says at this location when this time has elapsed. Because remember, these, this, this, clock, this clock is in the same location in the prime frame, right? There's only yeah. one clock in the prime frame. Or you can think of it that way, but... If there's two clocks there in the same location. Other questions? Um, I have a question. Okay. So, um, when we look at a problem, like, can you just like some uh, go over the signs which we would see that okay, here we need to use the Lorentz transformation, and um, if there's a question, we can say okay, this is just a time dilation question, or this is just a length contraction question, or like how can we look at a question and say this is the Lorentz transformation question? I mean, you can do all the problems with the Lorentz transformation, right? Yeah, like uh, other are just special cases for it. Well, if two events, right? If you're using time dilation or length contraction, so if you're using time dilation, that means in one of the frames, the two events have to be measured at the same time, uh, at the same place. If you're yeah. using length contraction, then the measurement has to, uh, the measurement of the endpoints of the object have to occur at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing, that's the only giveaway you can use. Like you can always use the uh, Lorentz transformation for any problem. In fact, that problem number four that you guys were talking about, I just use Lorentz transformations and solve them. Yeah, I, like um, me and Michaela were talking about that question before. And I like I told her that I did ask you that same question and you said that it could be done using Lorentz transformation. Yeah, I kind of wanted to do it that way. I mean, because you can. Yeah. Yeah, but I did it the other, like, I did it the other way, and it was so not bad. Like, the math or anything, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, I, and that's fine to do it the other way. I get so used to doing it with the Lorentz transformation that I, I forget sometimes to do it the, another way, but... Yeah, the thing is that I did it before this class, and I didn't really read a lot about Lorentz transformation, so that's why I just used the other one to get it in. And then you can see where the idea of time dilation comes in, and length contraction, etc. Yes, no, it, it for sure, I think um, it makes it easier to understand the concept, but... Um, but yeah, now I know. <laughs> okay. Anything else? I'm going to use a time after class on Thursday to just answer your homework question, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, that will be nice. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be available tomorrow, too, to answer questions. Oh, and then I had a quick question about the tutoring. Um, so it, it's for, from Monday to Friday, right? From We don't have enough people available right now to f fill all those times. Oh, okay. But okay. I, I put in the schedule who's available and when so far. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay. That makes sense. Cause I tried to go yesterday. In the it is. And, and I'll be honest for this unit, uh, this unit might be a little more difficult in terms of getting a tutor just because it's not covered as much. Right. This is the first time I'm really doing it thoroughly. Usually I just blow through it. <laughs> it's because, okay. because I teach it at the end of the semester. So this is the first time ever I've trying to, I'm trying to do it. I'm still trying to iron out the kinks, but uh, I'm trying to do it um, 
at the beginning of the semester, so at least you see it. Because when you do it at the end of the semester, you, know, you just drop the equations and you solve some problem and that's it. Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering because I went yesterday and there was snow on there and I was a little confused, but um, I didn't check out the schedule. Sorry. Yeah, the uh, problem, problem has been availability of students to, to help tutor. Um, when we get to the next, when we get to the next um, unit, it'll be a little bit easier because we'll have more people who've had 210, you know, and, uh, you know, who study Coulomb's law and not blown through relativity. That should be a little bit easier. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So are we not going to be doing um, relativity as much later on in the semester? Or are we going to keep using this throughout? I'm going to try to find examples uh, during the semester. Um, I might not present them in class. I might make a video of them. Just so, the, just so you see it. I mean, I'm not going to give you problems involving relativity on exams uh, for the other chapters. But I, I do want you to kind of see it. I, mean, I, 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 might be, I might ask a conceptual question as to try to explain something later on, but I'm not going to have you do a problem because actually the, the problems become kind of, kind of hard. I mean, the math, is, the math becomes nasty uh, at some point. But one can talk about things conceptually. Anything else? I'll try to have a sample exam by Thursday. Okay. Otherwise, then, I guess we're done. We're a little bit over, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. And that's fine. I don't, I mean, I don't mind if you, if you don't mind, so. Um, it's easier to do this when it's online, I guess, staying over. I can't do it when, it, when, um, can't do it when we're in, in the classroom and somebody, some other classes start, is uh, about to come in, so. Okay.